I just had this encounter with love in the mountains that shifted everything. I knew it was God, and then I knew it was Jesus because of how every time that I was putting this out, any question out there to the universe, it always turned back to Jesus. It always was pointing me back to Jesus. And then I would test these things that I would see, and I started seeing amazing miracles, you know? And and so I just chose to like not rely on man's interpretation and to just dig deeper into like, okay, what does this really mean? And testing those limits of like pushing through what might seem like a contradiction to what love looks like. Audrey, welcome to Shifting Dimensions. Thank you so much for being here. How are you today? Hi, Jumi. I'm doing good. I'm excited for this. Yeah, I'm really excited to speak with you. And I think one of the things that like drew me in was the fact that you used to identify as an atheistic Satanist. And now, you know, you're a Christian and you really champion the teachings of Jesus, et cetera. So what a shift, what a journey. Um, (laughs) Before we even get into what the journey is, what does it mean to be an atheistic Satanist? Yeah, it it can be confusing because a lot of people, they hear that and they think you can't be both of those things, (laughs) but I dare you Google it. You'll see it's a very popular thing, actually. So, yeah, um, there's a few different types of Satanism. There are people who literally believe in Satan as an entity, but most Satanists and they don't always call themselves atheistic Satanists. They'll just say they're Satanists. Um, they're atheists, but they just use Satan as a symbol, like a symbol of rebellion against religious and societal constructs. And um, they tend to be more on the Gothic side of life. So yeah, that's basically what I was, but they have these, these seven tenets that they follow about just how to be a good person to other people, how to treat people with respect and they they claim to try to be honorable and noble and um and very big in activism and stuff for like abortion rights and things like that and yeah so like i aligned with all of those things i never followed it as a religion it just aligned like when i found out about atheistic satanism i'm like oh that was me <laughs> like that's literally what I was. That's how I lived my life. I tried to be a good person. I didn't even do drugs or like drink and stuff. I, I just wanted to be a good person, but I was also major goth really into like creepy, (laughs) crazy stuff. So thank you for explaining that. Cause like you said, when I thought of, when I saw atheistic Satanist, I'm like, well, isn't being a Satanist believing in some sort of entity but the way you broke it down is similar to um, a conversation I had with another atheist who talked about Satanists and basically said that most of the movement like not talking about the people who genuinely believe in Satan um, like you said it's kind of like a going against the religious dogma and all of that stuff and basically saying, yeah, yeah, we're Satanists, but not in the sense of believing in Satan, but kind of using that as a symbol to rebel against, I guess, religious dogma and all of that stuff and the notion of God. It's interesting. I had no idea that there was this whole thing about what it meant to be a good human being, um, like certain rights and to to uphold or fight for because again satanism you just think of like evil diabolical yeah. stuff and people who <laughs> want to do evil things at least that's how i thought about it i think that's mm-hmm. how a lot of people think about it so thank you for shining light on that so can we just go a little bit deeper into why you lived your life that way like what about What about the whole philosophy about being an atheist, atheistic Satanist drew you or compelled you to be a part of that movement? I don't know if it's a movement, but you know what I'm trying to say. Was there, were there factors in your life that kind of made you feel like a God doesn't exist and religion is stupid? Definitely. And I would say it is a movement now. (laughs) It's a pretty big movement. Um, Back when I was living that way, I don't really know if it was so, um, but yeah, I, 
I just, I grew up with both of my parents. Um, I like to kind of joke about how I grew up with, I, when I was hanging out with my mom, we listened to Madonna and MTV. And when I was with my dad, we listened to Rob Zombie, White Zombie, Metallica, you know, just metal and stuff. So, um, and watched Madonna. So like, I just grew up watching um, just, you know, I don't know, that kind of stuff. And able to watch whatever, like I watched Hellraiser with my dad when I was like six years old. <laughs> and so I think those things, you know, probably just kind of, you know, worked their way into my brain and my conscious. And I had a lot of nightmares as a kid. And I went through quite a few like traumatic experiences with my dad being a drug addict and an alcoholic and coming home, fighting with my mom and tearing up the house. And my mom, you know, when my dad was in jail or prison, like my mom trying to take care of me the best she could, but also being lonely. So we'd go to parties, you know, so she could at least do her thing. She just brought me along with her because she didn't have a babysitter. And I experienced a lot of like traumatic things there. And yeah. Um, and then as I grew up, I think I just loved metal music, you know, and and it got into, I didn't like anything mainstream. And I got with a boyfriend who was into black metal and death metal. And so when he introduced that to me, I was like, this is what I live for. <laughs> it just like spoke to my soul. <laughs> so I became like a hardcore, like black metal, death metal fan of like non-mainstream bands from Norway and stuff. And um, wore the black and white makeup on my face and yeah so I just loved it I don't know it was a way of like expressing myself and um, yeah I don't know it just really became my identity and and everything was goth everything because it just to me was like an art form and I liked horror movies, you know, so I wanted to represent that. And I think also maybe it was in a way I dressed that way. And I liked these things because I wanted to find other people who were into those things. So it was like, I'm going to be this flaming beacon <laughs> of goth and, and darkness. But when I meet these people, I'm going to still be my true self. And that was hard because I did meet a lot of people that a lot of things aligned, except they were into drugs and they were into drinking and all of these things that I didn't want to be a part of because of what it had done to my life. And I also didn't, I hated that stereotype, the like punk rockers and goth kids, they must be drug addicts and, and alcoholics, you know, and I don't know. So I don't know if that really answers your question. You no, know, it but... does. It does. Thank you so much for um, expanding on that. Cause I know you said that your mom was part of the occult and um, yes, that too. Yeah. 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 And, and your dad, you know, had some run-ins, you know, going back and forth from jail, et cetera. Um, so I think that kind of like paints the picture of, like you said, how you grew up and, you know, what you were exposed to, et cetera. So God was never talked about in your house. Was it no. like, did you, were, it's almost like, I don't want to project, but it almost seems like atheism just seemed like the only path that you potentially knew well like I had grandparents who mm -hmm. would take me to church with them when I went to their house and they would talk about God but besides saying things you know about like how Jesus loves the you um, or that they're praying for me and they probably said a lot more amazing things but you know it just went over my head because I didn't want to hear it all I remember though is just them saying things like Jesus loves you I'm praying for you tattoos are demonic black nail polish is demonic you look like a demon child because your nails are black <laughs> like I literally had one of my grandparents say that um but I know that she meant well you know and so yeah, that was kind of what I grew up around and you know when there's a natural catastrophe it's God you know judging people that kind of thing and my mom there was a few seasons in our life where she would try to go to church, try to get her life together, and she would start reading the Bible. And she actually was like really happy during those times and had some amazing things that happened. But she never would like talk to me really about it. She wouldn't put it on me. And then 
she would end up like getting in a relationship with someone and it would go down south and she just um then it was almost like she just blamed it on god and then everything just kind of spiraled out of control from there and then she went into uh like total opposite don't want to talk about god at all nothing spiritual and then would go into like witchcraft stuff so like over time it would build back into her getting into witchcraft and like spell casting and talking about witch history and things like that and then that grows into her talking about the new age and so then she's just into new age spirituality and those types of things rocks crystals um and then it would get into eventually she would like go to church again so it's just kind of been the cycle that i've seen go through a few times um but now she's just been like new age for a long time. So I have like a lot of background with new age and yeah. And with uh, witchcraft and the occult and stuff like that for my mom. And when I tried to do any of that, like nothing ever worked for me. And anytime it kind of like, maybe I felt a little something, I felt like it wasn't the full truth. Like something was missing about it. It just never set well with me. I had friends who claimed that they were reincarnated vampire souls and that they were actual vampires. I dated a guy until I found out that he thought he was a werewolf <laughs> and you know, just, just interesting people like that. And, um, trying to do seances to get me to be able to enter into their world and have these encounters and yeah, just nothing ever worked until I met Jesus. And then I became a Christian mystic, which is a whole other <laughs> story. Yes. And I want to get into that. It just really sounds like your story, you you kind of got exposed to all of these different ways of religion or spirituality, or at least the concepts of it. So mm -hmm. I can imagine it was probably hard for you to place God or kind of figure out, well, what should I believe in is there is any of this even worth believing in because it can be all confusing right mm -hmm. have being told that you're a devil because you're wearing black nail polish yeah. um <laughs> and then you have your mom believing in god at one point but if something goes wrong then she blames god so it's this like it's it's difficult to place god plus the interactions mm -hmm. with witchcraft and all of that other stuff. Okay, so let's talk about your shift right so i, I think it's 2008 you're 19 yep. years old. You're on a hike. I think you just lost your husband, correct? And yeah, you have an prior. encounter. Sorry, say that again. Uh, yeah, a month prior. Yeah, so. a month prior. And you're in Colorado. I think you're hiking and you encounter Jesus. So please walk us through that journey and what that was like. Okay, so yeah, I was in the mountains with my grandpa and the hike happened the next day. That was when like, I recognized the voice of God was speaking to me and not audibly, but just like in my heart, you know, in my whole being. Um, but the night before that hike, I had gotten some really bad news and I was looking up at the Milky way, kind of like what's behind you right now <laughs> in your picture. And I just started complaining about everything happening in my life, everything that had happened in my life, all the trauma, you know, and, and all the things that happened in my mom's life and in her mom's life and in my dad's life, you know, just every one that I loved and all the pain, it just suddenly overloaded me and the pain of losing my husband, my best friend it all was just overloading me in this instance. And I found myself like, as I was letting it all out, just complaining and asking why I started to say things like, I hate you. <laughs> I hate you. F you. You're not real. Like, and it, and it just came out, you know? And, and then I heard, like this still small voice deep inside of me say, if I'm not real, then why do you curse me? And it was like this light bulb went off where I realized that I could say, I don't believe in God all I want, <laughs> but it doesn't change the fact that he's real. And in that moment though, 
that's not even really what I experienced. It was more like the there was power in those words that brought love into my life. And it was like, as I heard that in my being, my life flashed before my eyes. And I saw all these times in my life where God's hand was there, where God was intervening, but also like him showing me or God showing me that that was not their will to happen in my life, that that's not God's will to happen in anybody's life. Like God doesn't do evil and God doesn't desire evil to happen in our lives, but that like, I was ignorant to the love of God because I didn't know who God really was, you know, but it was like, in that moment, I just got this download of how, how much I was loved, how much I was seen, how I was never separated from God. And that just shifted everything instantly. And then the next day I went on a hike with my grandpa and we got lost for like six hours. And the, the day earlier before I had that big encounter, I had been looking out at this mountain range and I just said to myself, man, it would be so cool to just go out and like get lost in the wilderness out there. You know, these mountains are so beautiful. And so then the next day happened, I get to the next day and we go on our hike, get lost for six hours. And then when we finally find the cabin and I see it and I'm exhausted and me and my grandpa were both exhausted and I was kind of complaining, like I'm so tired, I'm so worn out. And I hear that still small voice again say, you said you wanted to see it all. And I just started crying, you know, it was just like, oh my gosh, that was an answer to the desire of my heart, you know? And so from that, yeah, that time, it just was like one thing after another, and it's been 16 years and those things still have not stopped. <laughs> I literally got goosebumps and I, I don't want to be dramatic, but when you talked about that whisper, that voice you heard in your heart. I just, I literally got goosebumps because I feel oh. like it kind of speaks to the notion that God is within us. Yeah. He's always with us, even when we think we've been abandoned, mm -hmm. even when we think he didn't have his hand on us, he was there. So I literally just got goosebumps when you said that, because, you know, that's part of the relationship. I, you know, personal relationship that I have with God. Um, but you also talk about the fact that you have come across and, and let me know if I'm wrong. You've come across some pushback um, while on this journey as a Christian mm -hmm. and believing in God. Can you talk about that a little bit? Because um, you do call yourself a Christian mystic and I want to mm -hmm. get into what that means exactly. But what was some of the pushback you started to get while you, you know, you know, did like this 360 or is it technically 180 from being an atheist to being a Christian? Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I, um, you know, some people would say, okay, well, you had a spiritual awakening and you know that it was God. So why do you have to say that it's Jesus? Well, the thing is, is like the scriptures kept being put in front of me. So after that encounter, I just randomly felt led to open up this Bible and I started reading about how the Pharisees were treating Jesus. And I felt like I was in it, reading it, seeing these things happen. And I got this revelation that Jesus is not the religious controlling person that I always associated him as, but that he was killed by those type of people, you know, and that really shifted. And then after I went back home, um, I went to a church with a friend of mine because her church, people had tattoos, piercings, like they were punk rock and stuff. And so I knew I'd be accepted there. And so I went there and it was the first time that I heard, and, and actually I had gone a few times prior to my husband dying and all of this, um, maybe like three times. And just cause it was so intriguing, like it was so interesting to me for the first time I heard Christians talking about miracles, the power of God, the supernatural things that I had hungered for my whole life, because I heard my mom talk about her experiences. You know, she had a lot of experiences with like poltergeists and ghosts, and she would hear voices 
right after somebody she knew had died and, you know, things like that. And, um, so I just, <laughs> just lost track. Um, okay. So I went back there and I was just amazed at what they were talking about. And so much of what they were saying just started to really resonate with me. Like things that I had been wondering about, uh, the pastor would basically answer these questions that I had and was using the Bible. And I'm like, oh, that's, that's the answer to what I literally was just asking yesterday. Things like that just kept happening every day. And so I plugged into that church. I'm like, okay, I'm a Christian. That means I have to go to church. So I, I plugged in there and I just became 150% devoted to this place. And I just took in everything they told me without even really questioning it, because who am I to think that I can know or understand or doubt or question anything when I don't know anything about this Christian thing. And so they were very radical, very all or nothing. Um, they would go out on the streets and hold signs telling people that they're going to go to hell if they don't turn to Jesus and things like that. Um, so it was really intense, but at the same time, it was like, God was discipling me like on his own, um, or Holy spirit. Really. I, I have such a, I love Holy spirit so much. Like Holy spirit is, you know, like a mother, you know, Holy spirit is wisdom and has led me through so much. And that is something I am thankful for that church is telling me that, you know, we have access to Holy Spirit at all times and Holy Spirit is with us. And so I took that and ran with that. And I found scriptures that like backed it up and things just kept answering every question I had. And like after a year and a half of going to this church, I finally was reading the Bible more for myself. And I started to see that I was being taught half truths. Like I was not being taught the full picture I was being taught to tell everyone and condemn everyone in their sins and tell them how horrible they are. And, um, but I was not being taught like the other half of the whole story. Like, for instance, I had gone to a ministry school and they trained us in how to go out and um, evangelize. And they use this thing called the Romans road. And anybody from like an evangelical background, they probably know what that is. And it's just these key verses throughout Romans that they say is a great way to walk somebody uh, to the point of like realizing they need Jesus as their savior. One of the verses, it's either Romans 3.23 or 6.23. I don't remember, but it says that for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And I would go out and I would yell that to people on the streets. <laughs> And yeah, I just had these whole, these key verses memorized and I would do a whole little sermon to people that I met on the streets using these scriptures. So then when I'm reading through the Bible for myself, I get to this scripture. And for some reason I got really excited, like, oh, there's this verse that I have memorized coming up. And I don't know, it was like weird pride or something. <laughs> but then, so I see it say, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The very next part of that verse, that's not even the only, like, that's not even a verse. It's half a verse. The rest of it says, but now all have been made righteous through the one man, Jesus Christ. And my jaw dropped. I was like, this isn't what, like, I've been taught to tell people, you know? And so from that point, like, God just ushered me on this journey of realizing who we are in Christ, this mystical union that we have, that we are co-included in his death, burial, and resurrection, that we can enter into his divinity. Like he came and did what he did so that we can live as divine beings on the earth and without reservation. Um, so yeah, and, and my church didn't like that. So that was the pushback. I'm sorry, it took me a bit to get to that. So yeah, they started pushing back and started telling me that I was being deceived by the devil and I had basically ostracized my whole family from me. I told my mom, I told my sister, I told many people that I loved that they were going to hell uh, because they were living a life of sin. And, you know, people who just really loved me, like my aunt and 
my I I never told my grandparents this, but I believed that they weren't really saved, that they were just caught up in religion. You know, it was just like I had these horrible ideals that I had uh, received from this extreme legalistic evangelicalism, even though they were non-denominational. Um, <laughs> and yeah, they, they said that I was being deceived by the devil. They said that I was believing heresy. And it got to the point where like, I would not tell anybody what was going on, like what I was learning when I was at home reading my Bible, I was having these mystical experiences with Holy Spirit. God was teaching me like these mysteries of the universe, of our bodies, of our union in him. And, um, but then I would go to church and it was like, I had told the pastor word for word, what God had showed me. And he said, if you believe this, it's heresy. So still to this day, I don't know what the heck was up with that, but it was crazy. And so I really struggled for three months trying to discern, like, am I being deceived or is this God? Because I'm having this amazing experience with God over here. But then when I go to the church, I'm leaving depressed and condemned and scared. And I went home one day and I had this major breakdown. I had already been having many breakdowns, <laughs> crying for hours and stuff. But this one day, I just couldn't take it anymore. And I don't remember what I said to God, but I was just letting it all out. And I just felt like Holy Spirit said, just open the word. So I just grabbed my Bible, randomly opened it. And the first verse I saw said, test all things. And if they prove to be true, then accept it. <laughs> so that was where I'm like, wow, there's condemnation over here when I am in the church and there is freedom and life and heaven on earth over here, you know? What a powerful story. I mean, you know, it's so interesting, right? I'm a big believer in you have to question. I think inquiry should be a way of life. Yes. And someone can say, this is what God thinks this is what God wants for us. This is what it says in the Bible. But I believe that whatever religion you're a part of, because I genuinely believe that Christianity, Jesus Christ is one way to God. I don't think it's the only way to God. And I, I want to talk to you about that a little bit later. But I think it's important for everyone, if not most people, to look at religious texts for themselves and, you know, figure out what does this really mean? How is this resonating with me? So it's interesting how you threw yourself in the church. And for a while, it was like, oh my God, my pastor is answering all my questions. But you still have the insight and intuition to study the Bible for yourself separately. And God started revealing to you different truths because you talked about learning stuff from church, but it was like half truths. And then when you would mm -hmm. go home and read the full scripture, it's like, oh, there's there's more to this. Could you please explain some of the things that your pastor or your church at the time would consider heresy, the things that you were learning from the Bible that seemed to go against what they were teaching? Um, well, one, I specifically remember I actually had gotten kicked off the prayer team. Someone on the prayer team lied to get me kicked off the prayer team. <laughs> that was traumatizing in and of itself. <laughs> um, anyways, so yeah, there's a verse that says that God was in Christ reconciling the cosmos to himself, no longer counting their sins against them. I mean, when I read that, I mean, just like, what is, what are they teaching us? Like, this is, this is the gospel. You know, this is what I experienced. This is what I have the intimacy of with God that I've grown to know. And so I, you know, told somebody that and they just argued with me like, no, that's not in the Bible. And then I would tell them and they're like, no, you're just misinterpreting it. And you're twisting verses, you're cherry picking, you know, things like that. Another one was believing that we don't have a sin nature anymore. That was who that was huge. Um, that was like probably the thing that made them the most angry was realizing that we are not bound to sin, that we are 
righteous. Like we are in right standing with God. We are one with God. We are free from sin. We are a new creation because of what Christ has done on behalf of humanity. So yeah, those are some key things that a lot of churches still preach. And that's not, it's not heresy to believe the, the other way. It's actually yeah. true. It's, it's interesting that you say that because I think whether intentional or unintentional, I think sometimes some of this religious dogma is to inspire fear yeah. and control, right? It's yeah. not really to inspire love and acceptance and freedom and free will. Mm-hmm. It's to kind of do the opposite of that, whether again, you know, on purpose or not on purpose. Yeah. And I think, you know, with me too, that is something I struggled with. I've always believed in God. I I was raised Catholic, you know, I'm Christian. Um, though I, you know, I think I'm the way I live my life and my philosophies, I, I'm probably someone who can't really identify with a particular religion at this point, but I will say that I I still lean more towards Christianity. Um, And I used to struggle to connect with Jesus Christ, right? Because it just didn't make sense to me that this whole notion of being punished or you're not saved until you call on him, et cetera. Mm. It just felt like, and I don't know if you've thought about this for yourself, but it just felt like, first of all, we don't know the true nature of God. And um, I felt like the teachings, at least from how they were taught to me from Jesus Christ, didn't seem fully loving. Like they were loving, but with condition, right? And that was the part that used to have me like hung up. Like, why is there a condition to this unconditional love, love that mm-hmm. we're supposed to have, right? This agape love. So it would confuse me so much. And I'm I'm honestly, I'm still on the journey, still learning mm-hmm. for myself. I don't have all of the answers, but it's interesting that you, you know, had that experience. And I think you also said something too, that because you grew up atheist, right? Where you questioned everything, you rebelled against everything. It kind of gave you, I guess, the courage to kind of ask about certain things, ask about the nature of reality and the nature of God and Mm in Jesus Christ, et cetera. Um, So I I guess that kind of ties into the mystical aspect of Mm -hmm. who you are, right? You call yourself a Christian mystic. (laughs) And I want to know if you could define it in your own words, what does it mean to be a Christian mystic? Yeah. Uh, Can I just say something real quick about- Yes, absolutely. So- um, Yeah. Oftentimes, like when we hear the words of Jesus um, and they are like people use them to condemn, they twist it, you know, like the whole scripture is talking about how the narrow way, like, I'm sure you've probably heard of that. Like you have to enter through the narrow gate. That whole scripture there is not even talking about very few people choosing Jesus. It's literally talking about very few people choose to live a life of love and forgiveness. That's what that whole, the context of that is. And so I just want to encourage anyone who maybe has felt the same way and had those experiences when they've heard the words of Jesus or the teachings of Jesus, um, that he was teaching or he was talking to people who were under a Jewish law system. And so he was not talking to people who were not Jewish. Everything that came out of his mouth and anytime he ever said anything harsh, it was to the religious leaders. Anytime he said anything harsh, it was to religious leaders, like the people that wore the the cloaks and were in the temple every day, you know, Um, and then everything else that just seems impossible. That was the point was to say, you say you know, that, you know, this is wrong. Well, I say, uh, you know, I'm going to one up you, or I'm going to like one up you uh, by a million. Uh, that was the whole point was to say like, you know, he is the fulfillment of the law. And it was to say that like, God did, God never even wanted the law. So when Jesus came, this is what I believe as God in the flesh was to live life as us and to fulfill all of the crap that we 
believe or we tell ourselves or we hear from other people that cause us to feel like we're separated from God, that put these limitations on ourselves to say that if I'm not good enough, if I haven't done enough, then I'm not holy and I can't be accepted and loved by God, you know, yada, yada, yada. And those are just all these man-made constructs. And he literally came to obliterate it. And so the scriptures were written in Hebrew and in Greek, and there's been a lot of mistranslation. And so like, I do really value the scriptures, but I don't worship the Bible. Like a lot of Christians basically do. They would never admit that that's what they do, but that's what they do is they worship the English versions of the scriptures when really they should be digging deeper into the Greek, the Aramaic, the Hebrew. And when you do that, it is amazing how much the character of God aligns with the fact that he is love or that God is love. God is mother. God is father. It's just easier to say he, it just slips out, you know, but Anyways, I just wanted to to say that, you know, it's like I, I just had this encounter with love in the mountains that shifted everything. I knew it was God. And then I knew it was Jesus because of how every time that I was putting this out, any question out there to the universe, it always turned back to Jesus. It always was pointing me back to Jesus. And then I would test these things that I would see. And I started seeing amazing miracles, you know, and and so I just chose to like not rely on man's interpretation and to just dig deeper into like, okay, what does this really mean? And testing those limits of like pushing through what might seem like a contradiction to what love looks like. And yeah, 16 years later, it's still, I still love reading the Bible and I don't, and when I see a contradiction, I, I seek it out. I, I, I hone in on that. And it's amazing how many times my mind has been blown because I see how it has been so blown out of proportion. It's been mistranslated. It's been mistaught. We have, we hear a certain word and we associate it with something else. Therefore that changes how we think of Jesus. Anyways, I could go on about that, but I just wanted to touch on that real quick. No, I'm so happy that you did because now <laughs> I want to ask, we'll, we'll get to the Christian mystic stuff a little bit later. I think people can tell why you call yourself a Christian mystic if they're listening to this conversation so far. But um, to this point, I should say, mm-hmm. have you done any research into the books that were not included in the Bible? I've read a few years ago, like I read Enoch and I read the epistles of Barnabas, uh, but I haven't read like the Gnostic gospels like things about mary and i had like looked at some of those things but i'm okay. not very well versed in it yeah the reason i i asked that is because i kind of want to see and I, the follow up question to that is what do you believe the nature of reality to be and that's a loaded question right and this is <laughs> obviously an opinion based that's you know, good though. Answer. And I, yeah. Yeah. Because I think, you know, one of the things that the Bible does, and one of the things a lot of religions try to do is answer that question. Mm-hmm. Why are we here? Are we the only ones in the universe? Is there heaven? Is there hell? What what is the nature? What is the purpose of this existence? Right. Because for example, some of the books that were removed from the Bible speak on something like reincarnation for example. And a lot of people, a lot of Christians don't want to even consider the idea of reincarnation because then Mm -hmm. what does that really mean if we have this sin nature and it's like you have this one life, you either do it right or you are potentially damned, right? So that's a lot of, you know, points I'm making there, but I just want to know in your deep research and you like getting deep into the Bible, deep into the word, what is your understanding of this world? Mm-hmm. Well, I have come to believe that I feel like Holy Spirit has led me on this journey of bringing me out of religious constructs, even to the point of me having to realize, like, if there were no Bibles, no more Bibles on the face of the earth, would I still have a relationship with Jesus? 
And for me, the answer is yes. Like, I don't need a book to cause me to believe. And I don't need a book to help me to believe. The Bible has been a tool for me. Like, it's been a tool to where I will have these mystical experiences or I get a revelation from Holy Spirit. And then I'm able to see it confirmed in scripture. And, and I just, I appreciate that. I like that. Um, over time, there's been like this huge shift. I believe that like the, the purpose of life and all of that is that we are one being family. I believe in the Trinity. I believe that the Trinity is the beautiful family. You've got father, mother, son, and we are created like we are right there in them. There is no separation and yet there's distinction. So like I am married again and I have three boys and they are a part of me and my husband, like I, in a mystical way. And even like in a scientific way, like I, my children are one with me. Like there's parts of me in them and there's parts of them in me just from me carrying them, you know? And so I just believe that like our most intimate relationships on this earth are to mirror our relationship with the Trinity, with the divine family, the God family and that, and that we're smack dab in that because it's like, we're created from that and we're created for that. And that is what keeps the world turning is family. You know, it's love. It's literally all we, besides food, you know, it's like, that's like the main thing people want is to be loved and to love, you know, and just to have intimate connection with another partner and for that to just continue. And it just so, it makes so much sense that, that that's because we come from that. We, we come from a divine family. And so this whole life is about experiencing the love of God, growing in that love for ourselves and for each other and releasing that, releasing heaven on earth through our love for each other and realizing how much we are loved too. I mean, I, it's, it's kind of like a very short <laughs> reader's digest version <laughs> and that applies to everybody. <laughs> I, I appreciate you saying that. Cause you know, so for example, do you believe in reincarnation? And I, I think you kind of alluded to it that even if there were no Bibles, you would still feel that connection to Jesus Christ, still feel that mm -hmm. connection to the higher source. But do you think that Christianity is the one true way to God? I believe that Jesus came to eradicate religion because really I'm this, I'm not against people who have religion or follow religion, but I believe that the context really is that Jesus came as God to show us, you don't know who God is. Like he was literally speaking to the people who had been reading the scriptures for centuries and who were, you know, everybody looked to them to learn about God. And he comes on the scene saying, you don't even know, like, you don't know who God is. You don't see him as a father. You don't see him as a parent. He's just like this mother hen who just wants to, you know, put you under his wings and like love you and protect you, but you are turned against him, you know? And um, so like he came to show us what love looks like and to do away with any law system that would put limitations on us from thinking that we cannot experience union with God without our input and our actions. And we have to do this and we have to do that or else we're going to be separated from God. And so that's how I see it. Um, and then about reincarnation. Um, I have had an open mind about it, but I personally don't believe in it because I believe in how Jesus has become vicarious humanity. And therefore, like when people have these, and I've had them too, you have these spiritual experiences where you feel like you're living somebody else's life, or you are in a moment in time in somebody else's life. And I believe that that is because we are all connected to each other. And so in each of those moments, there's something that God who is love can teach us about that. Just like in this life, we learn from one another. So there may have been something that happened from a hundred thousand years, not a hundred thousand, but a hundred or a thousand years ago um, that God wants to use to minister to us, to like 
bring us into that experience, like watching a movie, you know, like I, I have watched movies and sometimes I will start to realize how personal it feels. I'm like, I feel like I have lived this experience. Like, I feel like I literally had this happen to me at one point, you know, and that is in times where I just like started to process through it. And I felt like that was something that God showed me is like these stories that people even might think that they're coming up with. There is so much that has happened in this universe with each individual's life and considering all the people that have ever lived. I personally believe that each person and their experience is so valid and so valuable and so important that I feel like reincarnation would kind of take away from the beauty of this like individual life that I have right now, that it takes away from my, my kid being my kid, because if they are a reincarnated soul from somebody else down the line, then when we are all um, like in the like heavenly state, then how is that person still my child? And how am I still their mother? If they're going to continue to reincarnate and have a different mom and a different dad and different siblings, and then die and reincarnate again and have another different dad and another different mom and different siblings, you know? Um, I don't know. So that's what I've like come to think. And because we are each so important and special to God. And I think if you take hell out of the equation, then maybe there doesn't need to be an alternative to it being about reincarnating to become a better person in the next life. That also is a thing about reincarnation that I don't agree with is because um, we are divine, we are holy, and we are perfected in Christ. Like God literally took on humanity so that we wouldn't have to be limited by our own failures, if that makes any sense. Wow, that was so mind-blowing. One, <laughs> I've never heard someone say Jesus came to eradicate religion. I can feel people listening to this and being like, what he you know the <laughs> christianity is literally founded on jesus christ and his teachings right. and he didn't come to create a new religion <laughs> yeah so that is interesting that that's your perspective and the perspective on reincarnation i i see what you're saying i think for me when i first heard about the concept of reincarnation it resonated with me again I can't prove it, right? A lot of the things that we're talking about, we can't prove, you know? I think people will say that Jesus is a manifestation of God, but then if God is in all of us, technically on some level, then we're all kind of the manifestation of, of God in some sense, right? Because God yeah. created everything. So th the concept of reincarnation I think doesn't necessarily, I don't think about it as a way of, oh, that means that, you know, I have to continue to come back or it's a punishment. And and I know in Hinduism, I think that that's what it is. There's this thing called, mm -hmm. you know, a karmic loop and you have to keep coming back in order to get it right. But then in other, you know, philosophical texts, it talks about the need for the soul wanting to learn, right? And mm -hmm. I think somebody could argue that reincarnation is probably trying to answer why did God even create all of this to begin with, right? Um, again, what is the purpose of life? What is the purpose of this experience? If God is the beginning and the end, he knows all, what is the purpose of even having Jesus Christ incarnate into the physical world? Yeah. Couldn't God just snap his fingers and be like, hey, everybody fall in line, right? Because there is again, an answer to that. <laughs> right. I, I, I'm, and I want to hear your answer, right? I want to hear the answer that you've um, arrived at. So there's so many convoluted questions. And yeah. I think at the end of the day, I still feel like even when we know, we can't really fully know the whole nature of God. Because once we know God, then we become God, essentially, right? I, I don't think we can fully understand 
the extent of this reality, right? So to your point, when you talked er early about some paranormal things or like seeing ghosts and people who have the ability to talk to people who've crossed over, for people who mm -hmm. don't have that ability, that seems insane. Some people might even say that you're tapping into evil spirits, evil realms, because those things don't exist, et cetera, right? So I just think that the anything is possible. That's what yeah, I'll, I'll, sure. I'll stop yeah. there. <laughs> um, but yeah, you said you wanted to answer a question about like this. Well, I was just saying there is an answer. I don't, I don't have to, because I mean, I want to, I, no, I want to know. I want to know. That's the question I always ask everyone, right? Like, okay. why do you think God decided to create human beings and this planetary system, et cetera? Well, it was specifically towards you saying like, well, why did Jesus even have to, or why did God have to become human? Yes, that that's too. the case, right? Right. So I had this, I actually had this experience where um, I was going to read the Bible and I was like, okay, I, I automatically was opening up to something in the New Testament. And then I start to like judge myself and I'm thinking, or I'm telling myself, you know, you've become a little biased. Like, you know, you can't just throw out the Old Testament. Come on. Like you should go read something in the Old Testament. And so for some reason, I just left my, my finger was still like in the place that I, I didn't even know where I was opening up to the New Testament. I just literally grabbed it, opened it somewhere about before I was going to start flipping the pages. But then this all happened in a matter of seconds. And so then I flipped to the Old Testament. My finger is still in the New Testament. Who knows where? I don't even know. Um, and then I start reading something and I read something that was very disturbing, <laughs> you know, and, and I got pissed off. I was like, right. Okay. So yeah, I, I don't want to read this. So then I was going to go read something that I knew would be edifying and encouraging. And yet here I'm reading about something that's like full of judgment and totally against the character of the God that I've grown to encounter and experience and love. And, um, and then I just went on this whole rant. Like I got so mad and I was talking to my husband and I just had this really bad attitude. <laughs> And I was just blowing up. And then I you, started. Sorry. Do you mind me yeah. asking what script, like, what did it say? I in don't, that past? I don't remember. Oh, I don't. okay. It was, okay. But somebody, somebody got dead. <laughs> okay. Okay. Go on, go on with the story. <laughs> um, somebody got dead and uh, it was like God's judgment or something. And I don't know how that escalated to where I was saying like, why did he even have to come? Like, why did he come here? Why did he become human? If he was crucified before the foundation of the world and he is the, like you said, like the beginning and the end, then why did he even come? And many other things came out of my mouth during that frustration. But that was kind of the key thing that my heart landed on for some reason. And, and then my husband just said, well, why don't you just ask Holy Spirit? And I was like, I don't want to, <laughs> you know, I was like, I'm so pissed off right now, but I knew it was right. So I was like, okay. And so I just calmed down and I asked Holy Spirit and I heard, open up where your finger is. So like where it had still been in the book, I just randomly opened it or not randomly. I opened it up to where my finger had randomly been and my eyes fall on the page. And I think it was Romans three or Romans four. And this whole chapter is about how Abraham from the Old Testament was counted righteous before he was ever circumcised. And like that, there's a whole thing within the Jewish religion where circumcision is a sign of cleanliness and setting themselves apart from pagans and Gentiles and all of that. So because in their day, I guess that was like a big deal. And God told him to do it. And, but it goes on in this chapter about how like he was already righteous before he got circumcised. The circumcision was a manifestation. It was a, it was an outward sign to show that he was, that he was set apart. And off and it's like a wedding ring or a wedding 
you can just be in love with somebody and you two just decide you want to spend the rest of your lives together and you can do that and 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 it can be great but there's something important and special and seals the deal like when you have a celebration and you have a wedding and you have a ring you don't have to have any of those things to be married but there's something about putting it out there for everyone to see and so when god became man and lived life as Jesus. And when he went to the cross, that was at a time when, um, like I said before, the Jewish leaders did not even know the character of God anymore. And so he had to come to show us the character of God. And that was a part of the character of God is that he let us destroy him. He let us beat him and lash out on him and accuse him and do all of these things. And he's a laid down lover on our on our behalf for us and as us because we didn't know what we were doing as humanity so he came to meet us in our you know pain and depravity and all of that and it's not to say like every single person is like depraved and like hellbound what it means is like i mean look at the state of the earth <laughs> right now you know i mean it's just there's just evil happening and a lot of that is just because good people do nothing and, um, you know, we need the light shining in the dark. And like, he did that as a sign to us. Look how much I love you. We're one with each other. And now you can do greater things than you saw me do here on the earth. I hope that makes sense. No, it makes a lot of sense. And as you were talking, I also heard someone say once that the reason why you know, Jesus Christ and, and his, when people talk about Jesus, the energy that it invokes and why so many people are captivated by Jesus Christ and his teachings and his story is because of the way he died on the cross. Right. And their interpretation of that was the fact that Jesus died on the cross. People were taunting him, spitting at him, um, you know, just very horrific things that he had to go through and also be, you know, crucified. Um, and he did not resist, right? Mm -hmm. He just took it and he said, forgive them, Lord, for they know not what they do. And the interpretation of that was God, Jesus dying on that cross was so powerful and the energetic resonance from that was kind of elevating people's consciousness right to kind of similar to what you were saying in the sense of like god showing hey you know i love you this is how to act in god's light you could even be better than me quote unquote right mm -hmm. um so that's a very you know interesting perspective i think for me again and 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 one of these it's 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 one of those things where i think we can all try to answer that question. And for some of us, we'll arrive at what seems to hold a lot of truth. I have not fully arrived there yet in the sense of, um, in the sense of the nature and the reality of how everything is supposed to play out, right? Yeah, um, yeah and that's the beautiful point of it being a journey for all yeah. of us, this mystery. Yeah, exactly. In questioning and having such thought provoking conversations like this. And I have to ask you, because we can go on and on and on yeah. forever. <laughs> but I, I do want to ask you, though. So we started off the conversation talking about part of the reason why you kind of connected with the atheist philosophy and, you know, way of life and is, you know, a lot of religious dogma that was like that imbued a lot of shame, fear and just like um judgment right of being a sinner and going to hell etc so now that you have been studying scripture for the last 16 years you've had quite a journey yourself what are your thoughts on the notion of heaven and hell do you think of hell as like a spiritual physical somewhat physical space that we go to or do you think of hell as kind of the bad things we're experiencing here now on earth. So again, your thoughts on heaven and hell. Yeah. And that's um, my big shift that I was going to talk about. Um, 
when you asked. Yeah, it's it's definitely shifted as I have studied the Greek and the Hebrew um, and what these words that many translations have called hell, they weren't actually written as hell. Hell actually is not even a biblical term. It was never in the actual scriptures when they were written. And that is what is very important to look into is like, what were the words actually used when these people wrote down these documents, you know? Um, and so like in the scriptures, there's Tartarus, which is like the place for the demons, um, or the fallen angels. And then the Sheol, the grave, which I still don't really know much about that. It, what I've seen a lot of other people come to conclude is that it's more kind of like a, just a sleep like a deep sleep or something um, until the resurrection. And that could have just even been up until Jesus resurrected um, for humanity. And then uh, the Gehenna, the place of Gehenna, which was like a literal place. And in the scriptures where Jesus talks about Gehenna, he was literally warning them about like the future judgment that was coming, not from God, but from or it shouldn't be judgment, but just like the future chaos that was going to be coming um, onto the Jewish people uh, within like the next 30 to 40 years, I think, after he had gone. And so just historically speaking, you can see how there were just like thousands of bodies that were being burned in this place called Gehenna. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of historical references that explain like how hell is not biblical. And so that really took a big shift for me because I was initially taught that hell is, I wasn't taught that like, that's where God sends people and that he's happy to do that. I was taught that God loves everybody, but he can't go against our free will. And if somebody doesn't believe in Jesus before they die, then there's nowhere else for them to go because they still have that sin in them. So that was what I was taught. And that's what I believed. And I even thought that that's what I read um, in the context of scriptures. Now, after I've read more and I've gotten into, like I said, the Greek, Hebrew and that, um, I've come to believe that Jesus literally took on sinful humanity. Like he, he became human so that we could become divine. And when he died, he took on all sin. He took on the consequences of sin. And the reason is because we can then be a beacon to like, let people know, like, you don't have to be bound to, you know, whatever it is right now that you feel like you hate that you do. If you feel like you are trapped, you feel stuck, you feel like you just want to die, you're depressed, you're suicidal, you are in these patterns of life that keep bringing you down, like, you know, whatever it may be, if there's addiction and stuff, like, the way out of that is through seeing or, or realizing the fact that God literally became you and co-crucified you with him. Like you died with Christ so that you are mystically raised to life in him. And now you can walk in heaven on earth. Like you can see healing, you can be delivered, you can walk in freedom. Um, I forgot where I was going with that. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's the heaven and hell oh, okay. thing. Right. So therefore he took on death and he defeated death. So whatever hell is, is it, it's not a place of eternal conscious torment. Like a lot of people have been teaching that came in through the middle ages and has just been strongly misconstrued over the centuries. And that, you know, some people who believe in universal reconciliation, and that's what I'm talking about, is universal reconciliation or Christian universalism, um, they see that either everybody is saved or everybody will eventually be saved. And when it talks about uh, that word eternal, um, where people associate hell with the word eternal, it could be, it's the word a aeon or aeonion which means age for an age for a time. And so like, you know, if someone is denying Christ and they die, there's still like this age of, for that to be worked out. And a time of purification really is to like growing in their identity of realizing how free they actually are. Um, some theologians have said, you know, like hell 
what we call hell is locked from the inside. Like people can leave anytime they want, but if they don't believe that they can, then who knows how long they could remain in that place. I personally just do not believe that because of my own personal story. Like I had upside down crosses on my forehead. I hated Jesus. I hated Christianity. And yet, as I have been in this relationship with him, I've had these mystical visions where he's taken me back to these moments. Like literally, there was a time when I was taking pictures of myself um, with like fake blood on my face and an upside down cross. And he showed me, me looking into the camera and like where the camera is, it was like him looking at me with so much passion and compassion and love in his eyes for me, just like loving me, even though I didn't even, I couldn't recognize it. And now that I know what the love of God feels like, I can, I have been shown moments throughout my life where I had these experiences where I thought maybe like there was a spirit or an angel or something near me, but I had no idea, you know, what to say about it or what to feel about. I just kind of didn't even really give it much thought. Um, and like this time I was laying on the couch crying and I was just like cutting my, my waist. I used to cut myself a lot and there was this like overwhelming love, but there was this pain inside of me that I was like rejecting the love that I was feeling. And so now that I know what that love is, I know that that was him trying to be there for me, trying to comfort me. So I personally believe that like when we die, we are met with love face to face and all the pain, all the shame, uh, anything that we feel that gives us a guilty conscience or whatever, um, it will be cleansed and it will be revealed to us that that wasn't who we were. You know, that any evil that we did to ourselves or to other people that's not who we are. And just like in the mountains, I instantly saw like how much he loved me and how he'd always been there for me. My whole life shifted after that, like habits changed. There were things that I just suddenly stopped doing and never gave it another thought. Um, And so I just really believe that personally, that that's what it could be like. I'm not going to say it's exactly like that because I have listened to quite a few like near death experiences And it's amazing how even people who are not Christians, who've never received Jesus into their heart, they still like have this beautiful encounter with God and they know that God is love, you know? And I'm like, okay, so if people are going to hell forever, then this is totally um, does not align with this false doctrine of eternal conscious torment, you know, and that people are going to be separated from God forever. That's just ridiculous because you can't end love. Like if God is love and love is eternal, God is eternal, love is eternal, then that love is eternal. And there's no separation from that love. (laughs) Gosh, that was so good. Thank you so much for breaking down where you've arrived at that question regarding heaven and hell. And as you were talking, I was just thinking too, And I guess I've thought about it this way, but I finally just put it to words in my mind. You know, if Jesus died on the cross for our sins, then not to say that we should just go out into the world doing bad things. That's not the point. But if Jesus died on the cross for our sins and it's been wiped away, then why is there this talk of internal damnation? Because for example, in the Catholic faith, there's this whole notion of original sin Mm -hmm. that we're all just born with original sin. And it's like, but Jesus came and died for our sins. So doesn't that cancel out the notion of being born with original sin? Yeah. So it's just, just, there's just so much there. (laughs) And And Romans five actually says that over and over and over, like just as everyone started living in sin because of you know, what Adam did or whatever, like the curse that came onto humanity, Jesus took on the curse of humanity and made all righteous. Like not only did he undo the curse, but he destroyed it and obliterated it. And, (laughs) and it's for more 
it's it's for everybody <laughs> yeah have you ever I'm just curious and you don't have to go too in depth into this if you don't want to but have you ever studied other religious texts and compared it to the bible or just out of curiosity um I've heard like I've I've watched videos of other people talking about it I myself don't haven't wanted to take the time to do it because I still am having so many mystical experiences and personal breakthroughs and I do inner healing ministry. And so I'm just passionate about helping people walk in freedom and their identity. So I just kind of, and I'm a homeschooling stay at home mom and I podcast. And so like, yeah, I just, there's no time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if I, I'm going to read, I wanted to just be about something that I I know well yeah, and no, experience I, personally. Yeah, I <laughs> I I appreciate you for explaining that. That makes a lot of sense, obviously. Um I and I tried to ask this question a couple of times now, but we just got sidetracked because the conversation was so good. But what does it mean to be a Christian mystic? Um uh, yeah, well, it's just basically that it means that you it's you're not following a rule book to just get on God's good side and having to live that way until you die, hoping you make it into heaven. It is a relationship that you actually are experiencing in the day to day that you are experiencing the spirit realm in your life. You are experiencing intimacy with God who is love in your own life. Um, I mean, that's really the best way to put it. And there's been, you can Google list of Christian mystics and it, all the way from now to the first century, you will just see this long line of all these mystics that love Jesus. And what I was saying about universal reconciliation, this is not like a new thing that has been created. There's people from the early church, you know, within the first hundred, 200 years or so after Jesus, like they taught about these things. So yeah, it's nothing new. Yeah. I appreciate you so much, Audrey. This was such an amazing conversation. I thoroughly <laughs> enjoyed it. Um, this is my jam. I'm a nerd when it comes to all of these things. I love hearing people's perspective on what they believe and the different ways they've shifted in their beliefs, um, the different ways that they've shifted in their belief, belief systems. I can't talk for some reason. Mm -hmm. um, and I know that you obviously just shared how you shifted in perspective pertaining to heaven and hell. So I don't have to ask that question again, unless you have something else you want to share. But this has just been such an amazing conversation. Where can people find you if they want to listen to your podcast, for example, um, or just learn more about you? Well, thank you, Jumi. I've had such a wonderful conversation with you too. It's fun. It's it's great to connect with other people who are out of the box. I almost was going to title my podcast, Jesus Out of the Box. But anyways, he walked me through calling it the Eat Me, Drink Me podcast. So uh, eatmedrinkmepodcast.net is where you can find me, uh, my teachings, my uh, email address. And I love it. I'm an open book. So like, I love it when people reach out to me. If anything I said struck a chord in you or you want to know more about it, um, I can either, you know, help walk you through that or I can point you in another direction of people that helped me. Um, there's a lot of teachings out there that so many people just are not aware of um, because of how Christianity has been taught the last couple hundred years. But now, thankfully, because of the Internet and other resources that have been found, we're seeing these documents that are ancient and able to see like a deeper truth of God's character. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for stopping by Shifting Dimensions. Yeah. Thanks for having me.